Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Compelling Conversations podcast. Today, I'm happy to be joined by Soheb. Soheb, thanks so much for being here, man. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We tried very hard for this meeting. <laughs> We've been trying for almost 10 we days We did. Now. We did. No, 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 not 10 days. Let me tell you. You know, there's a lot of people, and I'm very grateful for this, honestly, like alhamdulillah. Mm-hmm. They come up to me and it's like, hey, like, well, when are we doing the podcast? You know, and I'm like, we'll do it one day. I just don't know when yet, you know, because there's so many people. Mm-hmm. And you are a living testament to one of these because you and me have been trying to do this for over a year now. And now yeah. we're finally sitting here and doing it. It's like, yes, I'm finally that. running down the list. We're making it. So mm-hmm. I'm happy that you're here. This is cool. And, um, Something I wanted to begin with was today I attended a a Palestinian protest. And I remember the first time I attended one was back in October at City Hall. And I was just standing there underneath the sun. And I could feel it kind of burning my skin. And I was like, this is better than, you know, maybe being asked on the Day of Judgment when a fire is near you. Where were you when people were being killed in the masses, when there's a genocide going on? You know, what what little did you do if you could do it? And I was kind of reminded of a similar feeling like that today when I attended that protest with the sun coming down. And I was like, it kind of opened my eyes to reality that it's still going on. It's still happening. And that's crazy because when I was a kid and I watched the boy in the striped pajamas that movie about the holocaust i remember it really got me emotionally like wow i cannot believe that something like that actually happened and then same thing when i watched the pianist it's like oh my god i can't believe something like this happened and now something worse is unfolding and it's insane that we're witnesses to it but uh that's just something I've been thinking about today. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. No, man, we, we're we living in a time, and this is right now it's just the time of social media, and we can actually see everything that's happening. Uh, like, social media is really a double-edged sword. It can be used for, you know, good and bad. And in this circumstance, like, we can see everything that's happening there, or a lot of it at least. But, dude, it's been happening for a long time this is it's gone on for too long this time it's a little different but i don't know if you remember 2017 i believe in Gaza, they were getting ready for ramadan and there was an airstrike where eight children were completely disintegrated in the airstrike and it was on video so this isn't the first time it happened man but yeah man they're going through a lot seriously it just really pains me to even see those videos it's, it's interesting you say that because when it first, well, of course, this has been going on for a very long time, but when the resurgence of this sort of thing started to begin back in October, I remember there was like a good two weeks to like a month or two where I genuinely was not sure how to contend with my emotions. Like, I remember it got very intense for me. I don't think I'd felt that way before where I was feeling those awful emotions, even in my dreams. And it came to a point where I realized like, I kind of have to not see that because it's it's so intense, you know? And it's still going on. That That's the thing that just baffles me. You know, it, it's still going on. It's been going on for decades. Oh, I'm with you, man. It's, it's just scary. It's honestly very scary. Like, we, Why do you think it's we, scary? I'm curious. For me, for me, it's just that, like, you know, Allah, Allah doesn't burden a soul more than it can bear, right? You know, from the, from the Quran. Um, those people, they're being burdened with so much that I think we possibly can't imagine. I personally, I cannot imagine being burdened with that. Like, that lady that was raped in front of her children and her husband, you know, the pregnant woman. 
like those sort of things like i i just think about that i, I really don't want to like you said i want to stop looking at all this but this is the reality for me the scarier part is what if the, what if i was in that position you know like i'm from pakistan i lived there for a while um that place is i mean pakistan is also it's also dying out like the especially karachi i was there in january and you can't even take your phone out you know in public it's, it's scary like people, people i'm just thinking that i was scared in pakistan in karachi in those circumstances i imagine what they're going through they don't even know if they're gonna go walk out take a walk or go for groceries or anything if they'll even be able to make it back to their family i'm putting myself in that position and it just frightens me honestly that allah alhamdulillah has not burdened us with such it's, it's just it's a lot they're going through man and funny thing is that you mentioned about the um, the protest, right? I've noticed the protests are really like how the first protest was compared to how the protests are now. It's not really a comparison. Um, I gave a khutbah at a masjid of uh, two, three, three weeks ago about. And after the khutbah, the brother comes to me. And it was the khutbah and the end I mentioned about Palestine. It wasn't about Palestine. It was about Ramadan. And he says that, you know, I've been, we've all been hearing about Palestine. Like we know what's happening. I think you guys need to stop mentioning it. Because, like, people will get tired of listening to it. I was like, well, man, you're getting tired of listening to it. Those guys are tired of pulling their brethren out of the rubble. And they're tired of being there. And they're tired of living this. If you're tired of, of listening to it. Like, we can't possibly imagine what they're going through. So talking about it is the least we can do. And, like, maybe spreading the word. That's yeah. That's my take on it, personally. I find it interesting that you mentioned the whole thing about fear. And I find it interesting in particular because it reminded me of the story of Perseus. Fear is such a thing that it could either like paralyze you and you freeze and you do nothing and you die. Or it propels you into action. You jump into action and you do something about it. So in the story of Perseus, you know, he faces Medusa, this monster. And it's a scary monster. And anybody that looks at the monster will literally be paralyzed, literally be frozen, turn into stone. But in in the face of that fear, he's not paralyzed. He takes action and he overcomes that monster. I think it's interesting because fear has that effect. It can mm -hmm. freeze you. But if you make the choice to, to overcome that with some bravery, um, you can achieve some feats. And... Another thing I wanted to mention was something I really liked. The girl that was leading the chants today, she mm -hmm. said something really cool. She's like, we don't want two states. We want 48. And I loved that. I was like, whoa, that, that's that's some neat writing. You know, we don't want two states. We want 48. Yeah. Like the original thing. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, all of these chants, I thought they were very very imaginative like i personally wouldn't be able to come up with them <laughs> i wouldn't know where to start i was thinking put... about that i was like man who comes up with these chants they're kind of catchy you know like and they, they got was... like something to them yeah no That's i i would way. not be able to man seriously yeah. uh these these all these chants are very creative man very creative you know like free free palestine is is just that but then like you said we don't want two straight spell 48 then you have the Arabic chants. I heard in a bunch of different languages. Like I heard a Hispanic, like little Spanish chants. They all, they're all like very poetic too. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they definitely Which, have that to them. That yeah. Poetic flair, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting for sure. Um, you talked about Pakistan, or you mentioned it, and yeah, I, I, I admire Imran Khan, you know, and the reason I admire Imran Khan is. Mm -hmm. He's a person that he who's like from what it seems has genuinely sacrificed himself for his people, for his nation, for a vision. And I don't think I've seen anyone really like that in our lifetime who was like so willing to do that. Like yeah, everyone I, else over them. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm not I'm not uh, too familiar with Pakistan politics. But Imran Khan was obviously a big name spread around <laughs> for a while. Uh, we there was a lot of protests in Houston. My own uncle was very involved in the Imran, the PTI party, I think. But actually, man, I 
for me, like I, in politics, I, I find politics very important, but like I, I, I first for for me, like first and foremost was you know fixing ourselves, our community, and that before getting into these like national politics. That that was for me at least. So I never really got to study or get too much into what Imran Khan was saying. I did admire his speech in the United Nations Congress. Uh, I thought that was very admirable how he mentioned Islam openly and also did a recitation, I believe. So I, I really admired that, honestly. Yeah. What's so admir admirable about it is it's, it's courage put into action, you know? Mm -hmm. Kind of like the overcoming of the monster, courage put into action. Yeah, it is like it's a lot of people, you know, you think that, oh, we just picked a good leader and then one or two years into it. And they're like, bro, <laughs> I think we're living that right now <laughs> with Joe Biden. Like a lot of leaders like that. Um, many most I mean, th there's a narration on this that, you know, in the end of time, it's one of the signs that the, the leaders will be the worst of the people. And honestly, you know, Imran Khan really did. He mentioned Islam and you were like, like he had courage and he put it into words and he put it into action and he did try it, but yeah, it didn't work. Apparently, unfortunately, it didn't work. Yeah, I think he's yeah, in prison yeah. right now, right? Yet, yet. You know, I don't really, uh, this is going to sound so corny, but I try not to be political, so to speak. But I, I remember to this day, like when Joe Biden, like his inauguration, I was like, who voted for this man? Who put this man into office? I could not believe my eyes and ears that day. I was like, really? <laughs> Joe Biden? I don't know. It's interesting. But um, something I was thinking about was, are you boys with Faruqi? Uh, Faruqi was Faruqi. There's a lot. <laughs> the, the Imam Mom Faruqi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know him. Yeah. Well. You guys look like you're related. Are you? Bro. <laughs> People got to stop with that, man. <laughs> I got I get Is that way true? too often, bro. No, we're not related. Oh, uh, I know him. We're friends, but I'm, we're not related. I'm curious. When you give a kutba somewhere, do they mistake you for him? And does that happen to him, vice versa? It. I don't think it's happened to him. He's a lot more famous than me. Uh, but yes, it's happened to me too many times. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's hilarious. <laughs> no, way too many times. <laughs> What is it like giving a kutba for you? What What is your process like? Do you get afraid of doing it or nervous rather? What's it so like? here's how here's the thing with kutba, man. It's a funny story. I um my first kutba was when I was sixteen. I actually just turned sixteen uh, on that day, and um, we read the masjid. And what I would do, I wasn't in high school. I would take this a different bus, which would drop the the Bear Creek masjid area. Bus, uh, so I would just walk to the masjid from that bus, and I would just sit there for like about an hour for the second khutbah, the Bear Creek masjid. And at that time, like there was basically no one coming for second khutbah; it was just random people would stand up at the, and start giving it. So I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna do it today. <laughs> no one's assigned. I'm gonna do it today. So I started preparing. I I wasn't assigned to it or anything. I just started preparing, and I had these like three sheets of paper. I'm like, no, it's a 15 minute khutbah. I got this. We're sitting. Um. And if you are looking for it, I'm just stand up. I go to the member. And I'm like, I'm about to give the khutbah. I look in my bag and I don't have those three sheets of paper I wrote. <laughs> and I'm already standing up there. That was my first time giving khutbah. It was, it didn't go good. I, I, like, it was terrible, man. I did not know what I was saying. I just like spotted out a few things from my brain. And then let's allow. How much did that, that affect you after that? Like, were you like, oh my God, big failure? Or what, what was your thought process? Bro, I was like, I'm never giving khutbah ever again. I was done. I was so scared, man. I walk out and I had like a bunch of people approach me on how I need to practice and how I need to work on it and how I need to, you know, write it down. Some were like nice criticisms. Uh, others, not so nice. <laughs> One person among them was Moody. Are you familiar with uh, Moody Hassan? I met another guy last yeah. night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. him. He was one of them. And I mean, I've known Moody my whole life. Uh, his name is Mahmoud. You know, we call him Moody. I've known him my whole life. And he was like, bro, you did a great job. You know, I want to see you here next week. Wow. I was like, yo. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but dude, like, and, and that's exactly what happened. I was up there next week again. And this time I prepared. And after that, every single week I gave khutbah for the rest of my, for the rest of the year. I was giving khutbah every single week. It was second khutbah. Hmm. And um, 
then finally I, I just became the second khutbah. I would say the coordinator, like there was nobody else. So I just like gave myself the position and I was trying to find like people to start giving khutbahs in the masjid for a second one. But alhamdulillah, I've been giving khutbahs for almost like five years now about at, at this point. I what I figured out is that every khutbah needs preparation, man. Like for me, khutbah is uh you have fifteen to thirty minutes. You have an audience of fifty to a hundred people. Some places I go even like four or five hundred people, sometimes more. You know, I have thirty minutes. Like so much information you can relay, man. Like not that often you have so many people just listening to you coming. You know, it's like free advertisement right there <laughs> for Islam. So yeah. I I think every khutbah needs complete preparation. Every I, I've repeated multiple khutbahs of mine, but I go through them. A lot of changes can be made. Many times I'm just like scrolling down Instagram, find a hadith. I'm like, yo, this is gonna fit in nice in, in that khutbah, and I'll just I'll fit it in. Next time I do it, inshallah, you know, I I read that one too. I think khutbahs are very important, man. Like, there's a reason they're so important in Islam. When so. Moody gave you that good word and he was like, hey, good gig, man, come back again. Was that like a reason that you you continued this? Or Absolutely. Huh. That was the only reason I continued, man. That's so interesting. Like, just <laughs> one person told you, like, hey, good job. I'm like, oh, That's okay. It. That's all it takes, man. Honestly, that's all it takes. That is sometimes, so fascinating. Sometimes you don't even need, and this is something I experienced myself, you know, like you can read it in books, but this is something I experienced myself that one person is all it takes. Moody just gave me a little pat, like, bro, good job. Inshallah, I'll see you next week again. You know? Wow. And I, I just, I got a little courage from that. Moody's, you know, he's a big name. Like, hey, oh, Moody got me, you know? And I, I've yeah. been, I've been closer to him ever since. Like, I consider him one of my mentors, honestly. Wow. Great oh, person, impressive. great no, person. definitely. He definitely is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What well, when I go to the masjid, I usually like keep my head down. I'm like not trying to run into people. But if I see Moody, <laughs> nine out of ten times, I'm like, "Yo, what's up, Moody? How's it going? He's a cool dude. <laughs> He's amazing, mashallah. Beautiful. Yeah, guy. yeah, mashallah. Yeah. But yeah, dude, honestly, and that's something that I learned too. Now that there's students, there's some new students. Um, like they're giving khutbas now. I have assigned a lot of students for the third khutbah at Bear Creek. Wow. And, you know, sometimes it's their first time, you know, they'll get a little nervous or they won't they'll end up making a mistake either in the khutbah or in their recitation. And one of these kids actually started crying right after. Like, I knew he wasn't, he wasn't like crying, crying, but he, I could see tears and he wasn't feeling okay. He thought the khutbah was bad. You know, and that's exactly what I do now. What do you do? You need dab him up, bro. You did a great job. You know, I'm going to book you in for this state now, <laughs> mm. you know, and they'll do better next time. Like, got to start somewhere, man. You know, what what is your biggest tip for someone? Who wants to give a clip then? Dude, preparation. Prepare. Preparation. Absolutely. Prepare. Yeah. Find a topic. Um, a lot of times what, what the biggest mistake in khutbahs are is that it's not it's not focused on a single topic. Like you have to understand every hadith can make multiple khutbahs. You know? A single hadith. You find a topic, you concentrate on that topic and you use that's all you do. You use that topic. You can use different narration, different hadith, different Quran, uh, and your own experiences and poetry, you know, or experiences you've heard from your teachers, mentors, anywhere else, you know, use those things to relay the message of that topic. Like, you know, sometimes it could be about something as like loving Allah or loving the Prophet Muhammad or following the Sunnah. And each of these topics can have subtopics and that could be a khutbah on its own. That could be a khutbah on its own. That could be a khutbah on its own. You know, yeah, like loving Allah for all the blessings and loving Allah, be that the, like for who Allah is, just loving the fact that this is my Lord. Then there's uh, loving Allah for that He has created you and brought you into a Muslim family and make, made you a Muslim. You know, all these things. And there could be a whole khutbah topic on every single one of these subtopics. A lot of times people give khutbahs, and I'm also, I'm also a culprit of this, that I'll be giving a khutbah and sometimes you switch off topic, especially when it's a longer khutbah. It's hard. It's easier to like just go off topic. And then the people get confused and they stop listening and they won't really know what it was about anymore. That makes sense. That is an interesting thing that you say, because something I've realized is whatever the thing is, even if it's like really tiny and if you're really interested in it and you have a lot to say about it and you just focus mm -hmm. on that, like people pay attention. 
Yeah. I was also, I think, like 16 when I first gave my cookbook, or maybe 15. I don't, I don't remember exactly. But um, that is something I remember from that. Is like if you are just confident in what you're saying, um, people kind of roll with it. And that, that's not mm -hmm. just even cookbook, that's just like in general. I wouldn't just talk to people and interact with them. Yeah, no, it's funny. I actually have a story of my brother, my oldest brother. I don't think you've met him. He's been in Pakistan for like six, seven years now. Inshallah, he's coming back next month. Um, he's the most confident person I know. <laughs> this man's confident is above levels. We were in Umrah last year together. And, uh, you know, he's like, he's trying to speak Arabic with these, with these Saudi people. <laughs> he doesn't know Arabic at all. Dude's so confident that people are actually trying to listen and understand what he's saying. They're like, maybe we don't know these words. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's hilarious. Dude's confidence is crazy, man. He, um, we're going to go back to the khutbah. Actually, he gave a khutbah here. And he was here for when my grandfather passed away. And he gave a khutbah that week. He wasn't prepared at all. And he just stood up there and started speaking. But he spoke like so loud. And he's confident. He's using his hands, you know, and everything. And people are attentive. Yes. But dude, yes. I was like, what are you saying, man? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, like how you're right. mentioning this. I like you mentioning this because it's it's reminding me of clothes, and you've probably heard this as well. It's not what you wear; it's like is it? It's the confidence. Are you wearing confidence? Because that is how people are like. Oh, okay, like cool, you know. I'm Whatever it is, you want, yeah. You just you, if you rock it with confidence, then it, it just it works. Mm -hmm. Usually, no, I'm 100 with you on that. What do you normally like to wear? Just like a normal T-shirt, this. Yeah, actually, I wear, like, the most American clothes. And it's interesting because recently, after the uh, my Umrah trip, um, I started, like, wearing jubbas a little bit more, like, every once in a while. And I yeah. noticed it has a difference. Like, it, it makes a difference on you. If I go to the masjid in regular clothes, okay, I'm just wearing regular clothes. But in the jubba, it feels like, it's different. I feel a little bit more elevated, a bit more feel in, the zone. in the more zone. Yeah, I'm in the zone. Yeah. In a way. yeah. No, I'm I'm really big on wearing jubbas. My closet has more jubbas than regular t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> Funny thing is, I own a t-shirt printing business, so I never buy t-shirts at all. <laughs> oh, do you? Yeah, yeah, I do. I have two business actually. I have a I have a Oud brand. It's called Stranger no Sense. No way. No yeah, way. I do. How have you never told me about this? Have I not? That's crazy. I don't <laughs> I'm always so, carrying no. them with me. Stranger yeah, man, sense. Stranger sense. Yeah. Wow. It's actually it was started by my my cousin's husband, and we're really close. He's a uh, Algerian, and he has this guy in Dubai. This man can like basically copy any scent and make it into like an oil. So we have like baccarat rouge and different like you know we have a uh, Gabriel Chanel. Um, we have Louis Vuitton, all these like different scents, and we have them in oils. So I'm good, man. I'll show you until next time we meet. Yeah, scents sure. are a big deal as well. Yes, I've noticed that. I've noticed that. There's right. some people in my life that I've met where, um, unfortunately, they were stinky, and I wanted nothing to do with them. Anytime I ran into them, you know. <laughs> and then there are some folks from like, wow, they smell amazing. I just love to stand in their presence, kind of a thing. Yes, yeah, scents are giant. Insane. For me yeah yeah my brother is like my my brother sofian the one you've met he's he's giant like giant on on colognes dude yeah. has the biggest collection i've ever seen he does not like smelling bad i'm big on oud butter so i always carry like two three different scents in my pocket <laughs> wow but we're always smelling good at least <laughs> you know it's cool that you say that that you carry that always in your pocket something i've noticed about myself that i always carry in my pocket and alhamdulillah is a pen because I'm just a writer. It's like, even if I don't have paper on me, I'll be writing on my palms, you know? Like, uh, really? today at the protest, like, they were saying things and, like, that, just the whole vibe, the energy there. I'm just writing things down. And it's, it's cool. It's like, look, things like that, right? Like, just carrying oud in your pocket, like a pen. It says something about just who you are. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not really big on writing, but that's actually that, that may really make sense. People carry different things in their pockets. Like I hate carrying my wallet around with me, but or like you know, or a napkin or something. I I know my my dad. He loves carrying. He ha always has a watch on his wrist, a napkin in his pocket. 
all the time. Mm. You know, like one of those things is pull it out. You know, I like how you mentioned that. So something I noticed about myself was if I'm wearing a watch, I'm taking things seriously. If I'm not wearing a watch. I'm not taking it seriously. My outfit, you know. I, your outfits, yes, yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah, I have a, I have a good watch. I just don't wear watches. I've never like I'm not, I, I get irritated with watches. You know, like I used to like I, I still do. I love watches, but mm-hmm. a lot of them stopped working because I I mean time, you know, over time. Yeah. But I'm like so okay with that. I'm so cool with that because there's this video game, The Last of Us. And one of my most favorite things about that game is um, the main character, his daughter, she gifts him a watch for his birthday. And it just so happens that that day is when, you know, the zombie apocalypse breaks out and then she dies. And that's all he has left from her is this watch that she gifted him. And years later, he's still wearing that watch and it's broken and bruised and everything. And so this other main character, this other little girl, she um notices that and she's like your watch is broken and he doesn't say anything and i loved that and i love that that he still wears it cuz it's like i don't care if it tells time i'm wearing this because it has sentimental value to me yeah and that's real confidence it's like i don't care it's just i don't care yeah it's i have my own reasons for this no it's funny you mentioned that like sometimes you know i think cars are a big thing these days like my brother he drives a 207 corolla you know while he has a benz standing in the driveway and audi like he has a car business so he has a bunch of different cars but that's just a car that he loves to drive because it reminds me of his of my grandfather's car and he mentioned that multiple times that our grandfather in pakistan had the exact same car 2007 corolla and uh he said that it just reminds me of his car so it's what i drive it doesn't matter where he's going, what he's wearing. It's going to be that same car that he'll drive because he likes it. That sentimental value he has attached to a car. It's funny you mentioned that on the watch, actually. I yeah. I have my grandfather's pen. He was a, a calligraphy writer. And I picked up that little habit from him doing calligraphy. And I always have this pen with me. It's like whenever we, I have a special box and I put that pen in that box and it just always stays with me. You know, mm-hmm. so it's in my bag. I carry a bag around. It's always in my bag. <laughs> oh, cool beans. Yeah. The whole thing about sentimental value, it, it's making me think about like Palestine again, that um, a person's history, I mean, that has to be maybe the greatest sentimental value in a way. Mm-hmm. And imagine if you've been deprived of that for so long, of that sentimental value, like how agitated angry frustrated it could make you that's uh that's wild that is wild that is man yeah they're yeah, being deprived of that dude low key, like their homes are destroyed they're you know it's high everything key. they build high key high key, yeah. high key. Yeah. my bad high key <laughs> their homes are destroyed dude seriously like everything they've built their ancestors have been on it's all been destroyed like yeah uh, I'm not sure. Like, I'm not, I'm honestly, I don't know. I honestly want to speak to someone who's been through this, like from Palestine. I want to know how they feel about it on like a one to one basis. Like, what are they caring more about? Like, does it, does it, does that matter to them as much as we think it did? Cause I've met a few people who don't see sentimental values, honestly. It's, they find it very interesting. For them, it's more about, um, it's more about physical and like, actual relationships and connections than sentimental values does that make sense you know i've known about the whole palestine thing since i was a a kid and i just i thought it was so interesting then and even now that the crusades were a thing that really happened in history and that went on like that actually happened and we live in a time now where it's something like that, it's something akin to that. Like we actually, near a thousand years later, experience something like that in our in our real lives, we were witnesses to that happening. And I think what was so interesting about that time period in history was like just Salahuddin and just uh, this idea of like fixing your faith. David Lynch, he has a quote. He says something like, um, fix your hearts or die. 
and I'd say something akin to that is like fix your faith or die, you know, and it, it feel like there's something there. Just fix your faith. Yeah. Yeah. No, bro. Islamically speaking, man, that's 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 the most important thing you can do. Like a lot of people, you know, uh, they'll say that, oh, you know, we, we believe, I think. And that's enough for them. You know, like, sure, you have you have the knowledge you believe. But what about the actions? You know, when you say fix your faith or die, that fix your faith part, is it only dedicated to, like, just have the belief down? Or is it also the hard work that goes in with that belief? Like, I believe in Allah, but what do I do about it? I believe yes. in the Prophet, but how do I show it? You know? Like, do I actually follow the sunnah? I'm sure you're pretty familiar with that meme of uh, Sheikh Muhammad Hoblos. You're like, brother, ew. <laughs> you know? yeah. We're already familiar with it now. People people forgot the context, bro. Like, it became a meme, but it was a beautiful context uh, before that. He was I don't saying know the that, context. Yeah, he was talking about like how people would say, you know, that they love the Prophet. I love the, you ask anybody, oh, yeah, I love the Prophet. And then you tell them to follow the sunnah. Like, have a beard, sit on the floor, humble yourself, be the first to say salam, you know, be kind to your elders, be uh, nice to your the young, or younger ones. And it's like, whenever these things you talk about, it's like, brother, ugh, <laughs> what's that? And that was a context behind it. He was trying to say that how people love the prophet, but don't want to follow the sunnah. So, and again, it takes me back to um, what you were talking about, about uh, fix your faith. I think that's a big part of faith, man. Like, if we're going to claim that we love the Prophet and we love Allah or that we follow Allah. You're on mute. You good? Is it, is it good? You good sorry. now, yeah. Okay, sorry. I think, I don't know. Okay. I was like, yeah, when we talk about, like, you know, we, like, fix your faith, is it only, like, uh, unbelieving or is it also the actions? You know, mm -hmm. Our, like actions are a big part of Islam. We have to pray five times a day. We're fasting in the month of Ramadan, you know, going to the masjid. Yeah. These, these are all part of fixing your faith. It is hard work, but we must not be afraid to Absolutely. roll up our sleeves to do it. Yeah. We're coming to a close here. So, hey, I like this conversation. It. Mm hmm. It's cool. It's candid, you know, and Absolutely. I always ask my guests, like, hey, do you have any closing thoughts? Anything you felt like you wanted to say, but you didn't get a chance to, or something on your mind that you wanted to express? Man, honestly, for we started with talking about Palestine. Um, I think people are calming down a lot. They're not talking about it as much as they were. Instagram stories have really uh, stopped coming through. I I don't think people should be stopping that something that it should definitely be spoken about constantly uh i mean there's not much that we can do sitting here but spread the word man make sure people know what's happening around you at your workplace and don't get yourself in trouble don't get me wrong i know it's going to be like a double edged sword but this this has become like a trend base you know there's a trend and then the trend stops and people forget about it. And the trend starts again and the trend stops and people forget about it for different things. This is not a trend, man. This is a real life tragedy and disaster happening to our brothers and sisters. I don't think it should be stopped. I don't think we should stop talking about it. And this is the month of Ramadan. Make dua for it, obviously. That's one of the biggest powers we have. Other than that, man, I think Alhamdulillah, that was a great conversation. I love talking to you. Always. Yeah, no, likewise. And I... I... I want to commend you for your patience. You know, as I said, over a year and we did this, but I appreciate that that you worked with me and we did it. You know, it was cool. Yeah. Man, it's um, everything happens in the the time that it's meant to happen. And and before we finish off, I just because we were supposed to talk about it at some point, gins. Yes. Do you have a gin story that you can close off with? That a you gin story. That I've experienced. Yes, I do actually. Okay, let's hear I this. do. Okay. So this is about a masjid. I'm not gonna name the masjid because people are gonna go there anymore. Yeah, um, it's only a few masjids in Cyprus, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually 
<laughs> no, no, we don't gotta worry about which masjid it is. It's okay. not. It's not in this area. Okay. 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 <laughs> Funniest okay. thing. So, uh, this was in masjid was being built. Uh, at the time, it was still under construction, and uh, my brother had a security company, as you know, and we were hired as, as security. And I was just there for the for for like about three four hours, and I brought a few friends with me, just to like you know we're doing security there. Why not just have a little fun? So we were there, get, just keeping an eye on the masjid. Randomly, we see the lights turn on. Weirdest thing about this is that there's no electricity in the building. <laughs> I um, saw that. I was like, well, five of us that were there. So we're like, oh, let's check it out. Maybe you know, like a maybe it's like a shortcut or fuse or something. Anything electrical could happen. We start walking, and I saw this with my own eyes. Three people praying in the masjid, praying in the masjid. Only the bottom part was built. The side railings were being built. So we're like, okay, you know what? Maybe they're just, maybe it's just something. Like, I'm sure obviously it's a masjid. There's probably jinns here. It was like open ground. We just walked away. Let's let them do their thing. <laughs> we're not going to worry about it. I It wasn't much we could see because it was completely locked. And you know how like when you're having construction, they have like those paper things on, on front of the wood. So there's not much that we could see. It was like just like a blurred glass type vision that we had. So we walked away from it. We go near our car and we just start hearing like loud banging noises coming from there, like loud, loud banging noises. So I tell one of my friends, yo, call 911. We're going to go check it out. What's going on? So two of us go. There's three in the back calling 911. We go check out what's going on. I have my gun on me. He's got a knife. <laughs> we're ready for anything. Like we're going to fight a gin with that, you know? <laughs> as soon as we get to the back of the message, bro. It's almost like there's someone running and just like hitting those steel pillars with with like with something, and we're trying to like follow that sound and it just keeps circul circling on the mud. So that we followed it twice and we're like, you know what? I feel like we'll see. But let's get out of here. We're out. <laughs> and we ran Damn. away, bro. We were done. This was scary, man. That was honestly scary. Like I didn't know what could have happened. That is a crazy After story. That is, yeah, and it happened to me personally. <laughs> wow. Very interesting wow. story. But y'all don't I, have to worry, bro. <laughs> I definitely don't know what much of this is, so no worries. <laughs> don't worry, it's not in Cyprus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> cool beans, cool beans. Um, yeah. uh, Wait, thanks for sharing that though. story. That was interesting. Of course, man. But yeah, man, I suppose um, until next time, eh? Inshallah. Inshallah, man. Assalamu alaikum. You take care, eh? Walaikum salam. Yeah.